Welcome everyone. Uh, it's one after the hour, so we'll get started. Uh, I see that Alan is wearing a great t-shirt and uh, perhaps has rearranged, you, rearranged your office. Yes, I turned my desk sideways in order to try to feel like I wasn't in the same place anymore. <laughs> <laughs> cool. You have a, so you have a new office. That's good. It's Basically. good to mix it up. Cool. Uh, we have a, a good variety of topics on the agenda today. Uh, so uh, we'll start working through them. Um, the first one that I had was about user land ZFS. Um, I don't know if the presenter has joined yet. May Mayank? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. All right, we'll, um, we'll come back to that if or when they join the meeting. Um, the next one that I had was the corrective receive pull request, Alec. Yeah. Hey, um, so I took some time and worked on the corrective receive patch and I have it in a spot where um, most of the tests are passing except for this one free BSD test that uh, for redacted sends that causes FreeBSD only to panic and apparently not every single time. Um, and without my patch, I can, so I've been able to reproduce that on my VM too. And without it, it doesn't, but I don't think I'm doing anything in the um, path where healing uh, flag isn't set for receive. So I've been kind of struggling to figure out what was going on there and, and yeah, maybe if somebody knows what the corrective receive redact panic or, or redact send re redact panic test does, they can talk about that because I'm kind of, uh, it's kind of terse the test itself. So I'm not sure what it's really doing. Yeah, um, uh, John, who's on the call, I think, uh, John Kennedy might have written that test and Paul, who I don't, Paul uh, Dagnelli the redacted and receive um, code. I don't see him on the call. All right, well, either way, I also wanted to just mention it and see if people can uh, start reviewing again and taking a look at the patch and maybe have some comments for me um, while we figure out this, this uh, free BSD test thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, this is the code that you posted oh, quite a while ago, but yeah, great to see that, um, making progress on that. Um, do you want to, because it's been uh, a couple of years, <laughs> uh, maybe give just a quick um, overview of like what the point of this is and how uh, and how it works, so that people who might be interested um, can can realize that they are interested and in, in help you review it. Sure, sure, yeah. There, the um, talk from a couple of years ago from the ZFS Developer Summit is linked in the in that ticket, so somebody can go and. and um, listen to that presentation, but I can give a quick uh, overview. So this is a patch that uh, enables you to take a send file and use it to heal corrupted data um, on the pool. So without really, if you have permanent corruption in your um, data set, you can't do much about it other than destroy and re-receive it if you have a backup, right? Um, but this enables you to use a send file from a, um, well, somewhere, maybe you have it um, backed up that um, data set somewhere and you can use a send file from the um, backup system to heal um, corrupted data. And um, some of the things this, so uh, this patch can re-encrypt data, recompress it. So if the, those settings don't match between um, source and destination, it, it, it takes care of those uh, of those uh, details. Um, and there's an arbitrary restriction of the GUID of the snapshot has to be the same um, as the snapshot you're healing. So basically the send file has to come from the same snapshot, um, we, which doesn't, it's, I, I say it's arbitrary restrictions since it doesn't quite always have to be that way to be able to heal, but it seems to make sense to uh, 
kind of enforce that and make sure that the data you're you're ingesting is, is can be used for healing for sure. Um, yeah, that's kind of the the overview. I, I think that should be cool the starting point. Yeah, and um, I remember back in the day there was some discussion about like uh, tooling around um, creating like a smaller send stream. Was that did that ever happen? No, I, I okay. didn't do that. In fact, I also took out the uh, spill block healing. So this only does write records now. Um, and I'm probably going to look at the spill block after. Um, yeah. Cool. It seems like this, um, the there's a very old, also very old and incomplete PR from um, a, a Delphix intern uh, about being able to better identify which blocks were damaged and like tell you which snapshot it appears in and stuff. It seems like that would be uh, really helpful for figuring out like what send you need to do to do the healing properly or even yes. like generating a smaller send stream based on that info. Yeah, or giving you um all of the snapshots that reference a particular block. Yeah, that's like one of the that's one of the things that that other PR does. Um, I see Mark maybe nodding his head because that's that's one of the things that he was was planned to work on. Although that that may be taking a, a back seat to some other yeah. projects that we have. Right. Yeah. So uh, if somebody is interested in this kind of stuff, then um, that we could definitely point you. Um, and, and give mentoring to somebody who wants to pick up that PR, since we probably aren't going to do that in the next six months or so. Um, cool. Well, I think that's great. And uh, yep. yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that. Maybe um, I'll see if I can get Paul uh, to take a look at the code review as well. I um, mean, other folks who are interested in corruption and uh, and, and send and receive, I think this is, this is probably a nice pull request to review. Definitely. This is John. I can also take a look at the, the panic just to see if uh, anything jumps out from the test. Awesome, thanks. Sure. That one's the, the assert you were talking about where the, the one total was less than the other or something? Yeah, yeah. It seems odd that that assert would trip differently on a different OS. <laughs> yeah, it's some kind of timing thing because the okay. free BSD 12 test passed with 13 and one other one didn't. And I've seen the 12th one fail as well and I can reproduce it. Okay. Cool. Well, re reproducers are great for getting to the bottom of it. I'm sure we'll be able to. Yep. Cool. Uh, anything else on this before we move on to the next agenda item? Nope, I'm good. Cool. Uh, next, uh, Blake three checks um, um, Tino. Yeah, that's me. I'm from Germany. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Blake three. Um, I've been in for about uh, three weeks or four. I don't know currently. Um, it was very fast uh, to implement, but uh, then I had a problem with the FreeBSD support because um, um, there are undefined references uh, in the open CFS, uh, punkt ko uh, module. Uh, I don't know um, how to implement in, implement this uh, properly uh, into, into the BSD stuff. Uh, I'm a Linux only user, so... Hmm. I run into problems to make it uh, ready to, 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 to submit, uh, really submit it, because uh, yeah, now this is the problem I have. Do you this have the, the error message posted in the PR somewhere? Um, there, this is a testing uh, on the free BSD uh, machines uh, shows the error. This is very clear. The automated tests. Mm -hmm. Yes, the automated tests. Yeah. 
And uh, then the, the other two points uh, under this, um, the, the, the SHAR next uh, or new instructions on, on, on Intel or the, the, the SHAR hardware support, uh, SHAR 2. Uh, what about this uh, currently in, in Linux only uh, some generic uh, code is, uh, is used? Uh, and uh, can this be better implemented so that uh, the shake zooming is a lot of faster? I think yes, or, or uh, within the Linux kernel, there are already a, a lot of uh, fast uh, uh, check zooming uh, stuff, but, but this is not used currently, no? Um, I'm not sure I totally understood, but are you saying that um, like within the Linux kernel, there's there's like infrastructure for doing checksums? Yes. Uh, and, and they're faster than the way that it's been implemented in ZFS? Mm -hmm. could, okay. could, could, could we uh, make some some connection so that this can be used or, or is it uh, I expect so um, I, I put a link in the doc of uh, someone else uh, on the FreeBSD side has been working on the same thing where we have in the FreeBSD kernel uh, our crypto framework has support for doing the SHA-2 offloading for x86 mm -hmm. mostly same. the okay. AMD machines have it whereas the Intel ones don't but uh, and for the ARM64 Yes. Uh, so I posted a, it's a bit of an old patch now, but uh, it looks at plugging that in uh, on the FreeBSD side. And you can just see there's a, we made a OS Linux version of it that just returns enot sub for so far, but could be plumbed to whatever function would uh, you would call in the Linux kernel to do the, the checksum. Pretty much every crypto stuff in Linux kernel is GPL uh, exported. So you have to have ah, okay. uh, this mm -hmm. in mind. Yeah, so unfortunately, using that, using the, the kernel encryption routines on Linux, uh, because um, you know, the OpenZFS project is not using any GPL only exports, um, that's not really a great option, um, which is, I think, why the, the ICP stuff is from Illumos. So that's all code, that's CDDL license that was copied from Illumos, all the C code. And I think there's maybe some very light acceleration in there. But yeah, I totally believe that there's more optimized routines <laughs> that we could use. And if we can find ones that are appropriately licensed, I mean, we could bring them in. Like if these FreeBSD ones are BSD licensed, we could potentially you know, copy those into the ZFS uh, source space um, and, and replace the ICP Illumos ones. The, the main bits of it are assembly files from Intel or something that are yes, Intel, Intel, Intel is very good. And those are, I think, dual license BSD and GPL. Yes. Uh, all right. But, yeah. Uh, I know the, the the person doing the work on FreeBSD is mostly interested in the uh, AMD like Ryzen and Epic offload of of SHA two, which I don't know if it's exactly the same. Mm, yeah. Um, I thought uh, it is a problem with the license and stuff. So this is not used as a, as a kernel API uh, of, of Linux. This for sure, that would be my next question if this can be done, but I think no. no. <clears throat> well, um, the next uh, stuff I, I thought here uh, onto the... So um, just before you go to the next thing for the Blake 3, um, mm -hmm. The uh, can you give a? Uh, I remember I researched this a while back, but can you give a summary of like how does Blake three compare to the other checksumming algorithms? Like, which of which, which ones is it faster than? Which ones is it more secure ish than? Like, what's what's kind of the you know if I'm using checksum algorithm X today, I would switch to Blake three because of whatever reason. You know what I mean? Um, it's about uh, four times faster uh, in, in, with the SSE2 stuff already. Um, and with faster AD, than, uh, than which other algorithm? Fast, uh, faster than uh, the, the normally SHA2 algorithm. But uh, the normally, uh, only the generic code, not the, the, not the, the intrinsics uh, of, uh, of the CPU and so on, because I don't have this currently on, on Linux. Um, maybe I should uh, take the Intel code, uh, the assembler code, uh, put it into uh, OpenZFS also, and uh, then 
could um, make the, the hashing bench uh, like the Fletcher 4 bench. Uh, and then you can use whatever you want uh, because this one is on this machine the fastest. So, so that the ad ad administrator can choose it on the fly which, which implementation he wants. How does it compare to the other newer algorithms like Skyn and Eat on R that were added? Um, it's Skyn and, and Edon R. Edon R is, uh, is also a lot of faster. Uh, I, I checked, uh, but um, Skyn not, not really. Uh, a, a bit faster, but uh, there, there's also um, there must the, the block must uh, have uh, some more bits, <laughs> also at, at about uh, 4K or so. Then Skyn is also a lot, a lot of faster, but um, that. Uh, that would be uh, also um, a question, um, which block sizes uh, should we uh, benchmark? Uh, currently, this is very fixed in the, within Fletcher, and this shouldn't be fixed because um, you can set up uh, different record sizes, and then you have also different speeds uh, for different algorithms. So um, I would um, make the hashing bench um, a file where, where in, the, in the top each row uh, means a different size, 1K, 2K, 4K, and so on uh, for the typical sizes. And uh, then the different uh, implementations and with the speeds also. And then user can check, choose whatever he wants uh, with, for, 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 for using a uh, mind, Plague or, or Sha on this machine with this implementation. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I didn't realize that the size made a big difference in the kind of which algorithm was faster. Yes, I don't. Cool. Uh, Plague, Plague uh, 3 um, is only uh, faster when, when about uh, 1K is, uh, is the block size. Uh, 1K and bigger, and then it will very, very fast. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that everyone's using more than one, more than 1K. Yes, I mean, yes. 4K, 4K uh, is the small stuff, but, I can imagine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have numbers currently because I, I don't implement it as uh, the, the, the patch currently, uh, the, the hashing benchmark. Uh, should I uh, make a pull request for such a thing, does it make sense or, or is it not, 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 not wanted? Not, because I, I don't would make the work when it's for nothing. I mean, I, I would see a lot of value in just seeing the results. Like <laughs> if you just made a table and we're like, mm -hmm. hey, like on a modern, you know, CPU, that has all the extensions. Here's how each algorithm performs for each block size. Um, I think that like being able to regenerate that on demand all the time, you know, I don't think that's something that, that needs to get run more often than like they come out with new, you know, new instructions or whatever, which is only maybe once every five years or something. Maybe so. even uh, hardware vendors would, 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 would take this file and, and, and promote uh, their product. Uh, it can be used for ZFS. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'll, usually the, the vendors don't get like that detailed or that mm -hmm. like it, ZFS isn't a common enough use case that they would spend marketing dollars on it. Um, but, but, but the future. <laughs> but yeah, maybe. Maybe. Certainly, they care about making these algorithms go fast for you know all the other use cases in addition to ZFS. Yes, and Alan, you would uh, make me uh, would help me help me with the free BSD stuff, and then we can make the plague free. Yeah, like looking at it, it, looks like it's just having trouble finding a .h file that comes from the Illumos compat stuff. Uh, it might just be a matter of adding an extra path to the include thing in the make file or something. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay. Oh, thanks. Cool. Um, so, uh, did you were there other things um, that you wanted to talk about the SHA two ARC sixty four stuff? 
Um, I, I could uh, make some code and uh, do it into, into OpenCFS. I have no problem with this. I, I would reuse uh, other one's code, uh, make it so that it fits and, and then it's, it's in. But I, when there's a need, uh, I think for, for Linux, there is a need because uh, we can't use the, the fast uh, stuff uh, from the kernel. So I think I would do it with extra pull requests. Okay. Then it's okay. Yeah, and I, I put the link to the prototype somebody has from the FreeBSD side in there, and maybe we can mm. come up with what's the right ZFS interface for it, and then implement the adapters for the OS specific bits in in the, yes. the OS files. Can we do? Thanks a lot. Cool. Thank you. Um, and I think the next topic that we had was. Um, the LXD containers, Alan? Yeah, uh, so my company Clara is doing a bunch of work right now to uh, add support for LXD containers uh, in the same vein as jails and zones. Uh, so you can delegate uh, permissions. So when you basically uh, jail a data set to uh, a user namespace in a, for LXD, then root in that namespace can now, you know, do ZFS commands and uh, create new data sets and so on. But they can only see the data sets you've delegated to their user namespace. Uh, so basically, it hooks up the enforcement of you know is global zone and and the similar primitives that are in ZFS. So when you call dev ZFS from inside the user namespace, you can only see the data sets that have been delegated to that namespace. Uh, and the parents that you have to see to get back to the root or whatever. Uh, and you can create new data sets uh, and so on, and they happen all inside the namespace. Um, the next thing we're working on now is hooking up the user ID and group ID mapping. Currently, without that, when you create a file as one of the kind of pseudo user IDs inside the namespace, the file ends up showing up as being owned by user ID, you know, 264,001, uh, which is the actual UID in the system, but in the namespace that's supposed to show up as, you know, a, a load numbered normal user ID uh, and adding the mapping there and so on. Um, the main goal behind this for our customer is to be able to run Docker using its ZFS driver inside of an, uh, a unprivileged LXD container uh, so they can run their CI stuff for multiple projects on the same machine. Uh, and inside the container, Docker can do the ZFS crates it needs to, to run that way. Um, but we're interested in what other use cases people might have for this and what you know test cases would make sense for it. Uh, you know, we're looking at adding the right um, ZFS test suite additions for this uh, and the question we have a lot is, you know, what makes sense here and what can we expect to exist uh, on the, the CI machines and what won't? You know, we, uh, you know, our client's use case is mostly the, the Ubuntu LXD tooling and so on, but I imagine we'll mostly use the, I think it's the unshare command or whatever that you use to, to create a namespace in Linux uh, for the test to keep them basic and so that they should work on, you know, all the supported kernels and so on. But any input people have about this would be helpful. Yeah, so uh, one from me, it would be similar scenario, scenario but uh, using Podman on RHEL. So it would be a Podman container inside Podman containers uh, to, 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 to run also the CI builds. Uh, I currently do this. Uh, Using the uh, fuse overlay FS inside the uh, master con container uh, on ZFS. So, if uh, do you uh, think that the work uh, on the ZFS side will also require some changes in the ZFS driver inside the Docker? Uh, we're hoping be... it won't. Okay, so if it won't affect the, the Docker driver, it should also uh, 
not affect the Podman driver. So that uh, that would be awesome. And yeah. I would love to uh, test that. Okay. Um, hopefully we might even have something to share for people to look at uh, at next month's meeting. Oh, great. Kind of related to this, um, I don't know if there would be interest. I haven't touched this in forever, but there was a change. And honestly, I'd have to ask to see if it was who originally did this at uh, Joint. But um, um, for anyone that's used um, ZFS on newer versions of Solaris, you know, there's you, you know, for things like zones, which may be applicable then for jails or whatnot, there's a, basically like an, I guess it's done as like an alias so that instead of having when you when you're in your container whatever you want to call it instead of seeing the whole path to whatever that dedicated data set is since it can be long it can basically alias it within that container to like just the name of it so um so then you can all your commands and everything use that and like and at least in this implementation i don't know how it was done on in solaris but with this basically there is a, uh, an alias property um, which in this case, uh, you know, in a Lumos, there's also zone specific data, which is kind of like thread specific data, but it's per zone. And so it kind of sets the alias. So then when you, you issue the octals, it'll unalias the data set, you know, before it issues it. Um, but so there's code for that. Like I said, I haven't touched in forever because it, I believe though, it pretty much worked aside. There was just some, um, concerns where it was kind of, uh, abusing, uh, are reusing certain uh, struct members that probably shouldn't have done that, uh, but I, I know. Um, but I don't know if they'd be interested in like, yeah, in conjunction with that. I think it would be because, especially, yeah. In some of my cases, you end up with the 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 part being delegated is like the the fourth data yeah. set down in the tree, and that's just a lot of excess stuff for someone to have to to type and you know. It looks cleaner if you mask it from the user and each user from their perspective yeah. basically has their own pool. Yeah, but I guess there's also potentially, I mean, it's security issues too, where you, you want to, to have that to be visible outside of your, your container. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the only, I guess, but potential issue, which really, I guess, is something that could be done when you're creating the container is obviously if you have two different data sets, you know, where the, you know, in terms of the, the last portion of the name, is the same that could cause a conflict. Although I think that's, you know, probably good enough just to say, you know, don't do that. You well, know, in general, we, like we already have the concept of certain properties that you can't modify from once it's delegated, like the, you can't change the quota on a delegated data set unless you're in the global zone. Well, um, I'm just thinking if, have, even if you The alias is like a, a prefix that just always goes in front means that namespaces it so that you can't have those conflicts. Well, I just mean like if you try to like, okay, you delegate two data sets to your container and they happen to have the same, you know, the last component of each of those names happens to be the same. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you alias it, but you know, it's probably one of those things where you could say, you know what, you know, don't do that. <laughs> you know, or just, you know, just fail, you know, when you're setting up a container, it says, you know, hey. That's so ambiguous. Yeah, I mean, I, it's probably, you know, something to note, but I don't know if it's something that would really be, you know, it, an issue in practice, but just, uh, you know, that is out there. That'd be the only little gotcha. And again, I don't, since I don't know uh, how Solaris did it, I don't know, um, you know, if they have the same issue or if they did something else where then that doesn't cause that or whatnot, but... But um, yeah, I can try to maybe something here in the next couple of weeks. I can try to um, update that and maybe um, and maybe put it up for um, review. Then, if there's um, interest, although the only thing I guess I'll have to figure out for the Open ZFS pieces, like I said, it does rely on you know what we call like the zone specific data to hold the um, some of the. the yeah, there's something similar in FreeBSD that we're using, and we had to come up with something like that for, uh, for the Linux one as well to to keep the which namespace it's related to and so on. So I think 
we have an analog for that, but I'm not sure. So that may be something maybe you can, um, you know, just that would make a little work and may need some mm -hmm. testing. So I do have, I have an uh, Ubuntu VM. Um, well, I can try to see if I can, um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and I'll see how I have to set up, try to set, I haven't, you know, actually haven't tried to set up a FreeBSD VM under Beehive on SmartOS. Oh, it should work. I think people have done that just so I can you know, to test it. Uh, one quick thought. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Sorry, I'm on my mobile. Uh, one quick thought about the alias thing uh, and maximum data set path name length. So I assume that the like unaliasing in the kernel happens pretty early. Uh, in the whole code path. So things might be a little surprising if you like add data set names or make longer data set names inside the container and you do not know how long the alias is that is hidden from you inside the container. And I know that at least in Zeripple, we have some basic checks that check whether data set name uh, will exceed the maximum data set name length. Maybe it's relying on an implementation detail and that's not really clean design, but uh, there are situations where, where people exceed their data set path length and this could make things even less obvious than they are now. Oh, and one, one other concern with regards to the uh, to the Linux support for the jail property. Um, and how are you identifying the the container inside the kernel? Yeah, right now it's the unique ID assigned to the namespace. So it's just a big random number that you have to get from the LXD utility or from slash proc. Okay, so the so ZFS somehow integrates with LXD uh well the, the namespace or how does it work no like you just do zfs user namespace or user ns add and the the id of the namespace and then the data set instead of you know zfs jail the jail name and the data set okay and so the idea is to extend uh lxd to know about the user ns sub command and then do the delegation Uh, maybe I don't. Uh, I'm not really worried that much about the integration with the Linux tooling yet. It was just make okay. it actually work so far. Yeah, because I think we need to figure out the story that, like, probably the the user ns command is the right approach, but we need to have a story that works for the different container managers on Linux. Yes, but hopefully, if we can come up with a nice interface, all the container managers will just adopt it. Sure. <laughs> and do all the work for us, right? <laughs> Sure, they sure will do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Cool. Um, I think that was all the things that we had on the agenda. Um, if there are other f things that folks want to talk about or questions, we can do that now. Um, we could also uh, talk about um, the big new project that we're working on here at Delphix, give folks a little preview and see um, what input people have. Um, okay. uh, I might, uh, if possible, uh, I, ho I hoped uh, Ryan Miller to do it that since it was his project, but I'd like just to uh, attract attention to a PR, uh, which is uh, 11919, uh, which is, uh, we talks about problem with extended attributes porting between FreeBSD and Linux, originally in Illumos. Uh, science uh, historically happens that we have two completely uh, incompatible implementation and uh, we at the system particularly hit this compatibility issue science we have two products on FreeBSD and Linux which are at this point incompatible so uh, well, all the things described uh, in a pull request if short uh, on Linux I think user space attributes are prefixed with a user dot and, and then name uh, on FreeBSD, there is no this prefix and question how to make it com compatible. So uh, if somebody 
have interest in uh, area of extended attributes or have ideas, I'd like to welcome you to that PR. It's 11919. Cool. Um, yeah, I, I haven't looked into that very deeply, but uh, thank you for taking on that uh, bit of incompatibility that is one of those things that hopefully we can avoid those in the future, you know, through the, the coordination of OpenZFS. And obviously, FreeBSD and Linux are using the same repo now, but for the other, for the other um, operating systems as well. Cool. Uh, well, I can talk a little bit about uh, a new project that we're working on at Delphix, which is ZFS on object storage. So the idea is, like you know, today you create a storage pool; it's on some disks, um, you know, block storage. Um, we want to make ZFS so that it can run on top of an object store like um, Amazon S3 or on-prem ones like MinIO or NetApp has uh, an, like an object store product as well. Um, the, uh, I think that there's been some attempts or thoughts about this before. Um, the one kind of interesting thing that we're bringing to it is like our use case is databases. So we need this to work well and perform well. Um, even if you're using small block sizes, you know the the performance of object stores generally is like the latency is very large, and you also need to use large objects to get good throughput. Um, so having a simple like one-to-one -one mapping of ZFS blocks to um, objects, uh, you know, could work well for like archive archival use cases where you can set record size to 16 meg. Um, but for our use case where we have databases with record size 8K, um, that would not work at all for performance. So uh, we're taking like a bunch of ZFS blocks, combining them into one object, and then storing that with the object store. Um, so there's kind of two components to this project. One is like making ZFS talk to the object store, and we're using a user land agent to do this. Um, to kind of intermediate that stuff. And then the other component is um, we want to be able to get really, really good performance if you can give enough cache, enough local cache uh, or, or block-based cache. So um, the goal is that you should be able to get performance that's similar to a block-based storage pool if, the, um, if you have enough, if you have a big enough block-based cache that you're getting like more than 90% cache hits in the in that cache. So, uh, in principle, this is kind of the same uh, tech. The same. It's it's the problem that the L2 arc is trying to solve, in terms of having you know a, a caching layer that's much faster than the storage of the main pool. Um, but the L2 arc as it exists today is not really doesn't cut it for our use case. Um, the well, one of the big problems is that. The amount of memory required to manage the L2 work is really big because um, it's proportional to like the number of blocks that are in the L2 work because there's a record for each of those blocks in, in memory. Um, and so we want to have really big caches like hundreds of terabytes um, and have small record sizes. So you have lots and lots and lots and lots of blocks. So uh, we're looking at um, Basically, creating a replacement for the L2 arc that would um, store the index inside of the cache itself rather than requiring it to be in memory. So you can have an unlimited size L2 arc managed with a fixed amount of memory. Um, yeah, so those are the two big components that we're working on implementing. And um, some of the feedback that we like from this group is on like, the administrative model and also just kind of questions that you guys have. But um, we can probably work on soon, like publishing like what we see as the interface, the user interface for this. Um, right now we have like a bunch of new properties that let you specify. So there's a new VDEV type for the object store. There's a bunch of new properties that let you specify like the endpoint, um, like the, the S3 UR, endpoint URL. Um, and um, 
Yeah, and then we plan to support other protocols as well, not just S3 protocol, um, but the other main one is Azure. So most, almost everybody uses the S3 protocol, even if, even if they aren't Amazon, but um, Azure has their own protocol for object store that's like basically equivalent, um, at least in terms of the things that we would be using, just the basic like get, put, um, delete um, operations. So questions, comments? Uh, I've, got one I about the, that... I said, I've got one about the cache, actually. You're looking yeah. at a block cache. Is it just going to be a read cache or a write cache? Because we've had cases come up before, too, where it would be really desirable to have, you know, 100 terabytes of write back cache for ZFS2 on block device. Um, so we're looking at just using the existing Zill in terms of um, in terms of uh, write caching. So uh, th because the object store um, actually can get very good throughput as long as you have large enough objects and you can issue enough concurrent put requests. Um, so like you can you can max out uh, even more than 25 gigabits per second um, network uh, on AWS. Uh, so you you know the right throughput should be very very high. Um, but in terms of that problem space, I know Nixenta did something. They had a they actually implemented a write back cache. And I think they shipped it in their product. Maybe they're still shipping it in their product. Um, I think that Alex Eisman gave a talk at the conference like many years ago about it. Um, so you might be interested to check that out. I go ahead. I was just gonna say I think the thing that we need to like that you know we're kind of counting on is that a the Zill would be able to keep up for certain right workloads. But if you if your right workload is incredibly intense, then yeah, there might have to be like additional work that needs to be done in either modifying the Zill to like you know perform better or a uh, some other component, which is like a write back hash that, that would kind of be like a step in between you and the object store. Yeah, so you really like get more like a layered file system at that point. Yeah, we think like for our use case, we think the Zill will, will work well, um, but you know, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. One question Thanks for the to the next center thing. I will definitely check that out, but that's, yeah. Yeah, sure thing. I think there's yep. someone else who had a comment. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcin. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, one question for me is uh, access to the uh, pool, uh, I assume, will not be uh, clustered. Uh, it will not. <laughs> yeah, uh, because one use case that immediately come into my head is uh, the persistent volumes for the containers in Kubernetes cluster. So if we somehow uh, could make it work in a clustered manner, that would be awesome uh, use case. Uh, we have had similar thoughts. Um... The, the, the project that we're working on currently does not include that work, but um, attend the future conferences and hopefully we will have more to say about that. Yeah, so Marcin, one question for you, like um, in the use case you're talking about, are you, is it typically the case that your containers need access to all the entire pool or like a subset of the pool or? It, uh... For me, uh, the um, good enough uh, situation is when I have uh, mounted uh, same pool on multiple nodes, but uh, single node have access to the single data set. So the data set doesn't have to be clustered, but the uh, pool uh, should work on multiple nodes. Uh, and that's good enough and that should work uh, perfectly for for my With, case yeah do you that, want all, all those nodes to be able to write at the same time or uh to the pool yes to the single data set no so okay. uh, one one node writes to the uh, specific uh, data set but uh, multiple nodes write to the their own data sets yeah so as matt said stay stay tuned 
Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so when you mentioned using a larger block size for the or object size for the object, like uh, what kind of scale was that? And do you expect that might be flexible? Um, yeah, I mean, property? it could definitely be. It could definitely be like tuned. Um, the sweet spot um, for like performance is a few megabytes, so like one to eight megabytes um, on on S3. Um, and yeah, I mean that might change, you know, with different cloud providers or with on-prem solutions like MinIO. Um, and uh, you know that's probably something that would need to be configured or you know could be could be configured um, in terms of the target object size there. I mean one question it, for, for sorry, go ahead, Matt. I was gonna say, and you know, because that's within the range of potential ZFS record sizes, you could imagine that like maybe record size one meg and larger does have a one-to-one -one mapping, mm -hmm. um, which simplifies, you know, a bunch of stuff. Um, but the the you know for our use case we really care about the smaller record sizes so we need to make that work really well right yeah and, and the question I was going to ask for you know uh, with regards to like feedback is if folks currently are not necessarily using ZFS but using like these object stores for different types of workloads um, and you think that ZFS might be a fit there it would be interesting just to kind of like send us that feedback. We obviously have our use case that we're very interested in, but uh, it, it would be good to kind of get a feel for like what else is out there that, that folks are interested in, in kind of taking advantage of this, this technology. Yeah, I mean, we wanna uh, obviously develop this for our company's use case, but we want to upstream it and, and make it part of OpenZFS as well. And so, um, you know, we wanna make sure that we aren't missing anything about use cases that are adjacent that we can also make work well, um, you know, without a lot of extra effort. Uh, maybe not like exactly. Large block size one. Sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, maybe not exactly an object storage use case, but I was thinking about like, if there is some infrastructure to group changes together into object store sized blocks, right? That seems like it could have some synergies with regards to SMR drives, host managed SMR drives. Absolutely. So I, I, see, I see some synergies there. And if the software architecture can be made such that like the, the aggregation of changes into these larger sized records uh, can happen in a way that like the next layer down can be either SMR drive or object storage. I think uh, there is some potential there that should be uh, like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know more about SMR drives than, than I do certainly, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, uh, so the all, all of this object store stuff, it's all, as I mentioned, intermediated by user land. So ZFS, is talking blocks up to the user line agent. So, so the ZFS kernel is like, write this 3K block, write this 3.5K block, write this 2K block, um, sending those commands up to the agent, um, which is like just a process running on the same computer. And then uh, the agent is coalescing those into objects and then um, sending them over the network to the object store. Um, so they, they don't have any relation to the actual ZFS objects. And yeah. their object number. Same same name, but uh, right. Completely different thing. Yeah. Right. Because you know when I first envisioned something like this, I was I thought there was value in trying to keep uh, a mapping to the ZFS objects back to what's in the object store no. for so, locality and so on. But I think with small ones, it it doesn't make sense in your case for sure. Yeah. And then you know we um, you know ZFS has snapshots and copy on <laughs> Ray and clones, which are you know our product makes heavy use of. Um, so that kind of breaks any ideas about like the ZFS, you know, file being even one thing, right? Um, the, uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. So, oh, so SMR drives. Um, 
yeah, so you could imagine like plugging in, like teaching that userland agent to be able to write to SMR, write the like objects to SMR drives instead. Um, I imagine that uh, since a lot of the SMR drives are going towards um, whether they call it drive managed, where they like look like a regular drive, they, they put, some, put a bunch of smarts in there to do the, the mapping th themselves. But it only really works, it only really performs well if you're writing in big contiguous chunks, right? Um, I could imagine a, like maybe good enough solution being to have the agent just take each object and write it, like say target target object size instead of three, instead of four megs, it's a hundred megs. And then um, just write those as files into a non-copy on write file system, right? Like use FAT32 on your uh, on your SMR drive, and then just like splat down all these huge files that are actually you know contain ZFS blocks, um, and then the uh, you know the, one of the tricky things with this is that uh, it, what if your workload is uh, contains freeze. <laughs> um, so like, what if you're actually uh, freeing blocks, freeing a significant amount of blocks over time, um, which ours does for sure. Um, then, you know, you, in order to actually release space from the object store, you have to read and then rewrite the object um, to remove those blocks. You can't just like, Free the little bit of the object, right? You got to read the whole thing and then rewrite it out, omitting the blocks that are no longer part of it. Um, that that kind of scheme would also work really well with SMR, um, where it's like, okay, great, we're just gonna like remove this hundred meg file and then like reallocate another one, and then um, you know later on we'll splat another different hundred meg file over where that one used to be. Um, I could imagine that working really well, kind of. Uh, you know, not being 100% optimal, but like good enough that you would get good performance, even with um, you know small record size and and random-ish access. Yeah, really. The way I mean, we've kind of architected this because we have this new VDEV type. You could, you know, you can imagine the SMR being driven by you know a user land agent or some sub kernel component that that VDEV object now talks to. So you could implement, you know, take the things that we're putting into our user land agent, bring them into the kernel and then do it that way too. Like, but a lot of the principles all apply here. Like, yeah. Um, Although I think that the, um, you would want to leverage the coalescing, right? The, the coalescing of blocks into a big object happens in the agent and you'd, you'd want to leverage that, that for SMR. Yeah. 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 You'd have to pull that into like some SMR specific kernel yeah. module or whatever like which might be a little challenging because uh we are writing the agent in rust so all yeah. of the passwords but but actually that's what i was thinking that taking a step back and looking at the at the overall system architecture and what components make sense to centralize in the zfs module uh because like I think, I think the aggregation stuff and also uh, the stuff related to freeing and uh, repacking changes into different objects is something is, is logic that should be centralized. Yeah. Um. Cool. What, what do you, um, I'm trying to see if other team members are here. Um, George, do you think it would make sense to have a thread on the mailing list or maybe even like a, uh, an issue or a PR to discuss, to like show folks the user interface that we're proposing and get feedback on that? Yeah, Is I it? think that would be great. I think okay. um, having a way so that you know, people can comment on kind of what we're proposing, um, you know, kind of the keys, the new like um, keywords that that we're thinking about and kind of their meaning and, and um, 
the various parameters, I think it would be great to get feedback. And, and I don't know, like maybe if we can put it like as an issues, that would be great. Um, I think that's a little bit easier to manage than, yeah, than, the mailing than, list. than a mailing list, yeah. All right, maybe we can do that the next, probably before the next meeting. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in what the user interface looks like and trying to, you know, make sure we make something that fits well and and has the flexibility we want to go forward. Because, you know, those interfaces tend to be once they're released, we can't ever change it. Yeah, I mean, the um, we're kind of doing it all through just properties. So you can always I'm have a definitely pro that. <laughs> You know, have a different thing that um, you know where it's like, oh yeah, you didn't specify the X property, but instead you specified the Y property, or the, the the Y property has a form that I can recognize, and therefore I relax my requirement of having you have to have the X property. Um, and we've talked about that already, because the the new properties are like the um, uh, object store endpoint, the like HTTP endpoint, the bucket. Well, sorry, the um, the region um, and the uh, key store key location, which is kind of similar to the encryption key location, where it can be like you know file colon slash slash, and then inside there it has like uh, credentials um, that are in a you know specific to whatever your protocol object store protocol is, um, and then the the name of the VDEV is the bucket name. So you do like something like, you know, Zipl create dash O, um, you know, endpoint equals HTTP colon slash slash blah, 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 dash O uh, region equals, you know, US West two dash O keys, you know, key look object store key location equals file colon slash slash whatever. And then uh, S3 is the, um, VDEV type, and then um, the bucket name comes after that, just like you'd be specifying, like, you know, mirror and then device one, device two, or whatever. Yeah, I think that's one thing we haven't looked at yet with the VDEV property stuff is how to specify properties on VDEVs as you're creating them. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because here, you know, logically, these, these properties obviously apply to the VDEV and not to the pool as a whole. But we can kind of get away with pool properties because it's like there's really like there's really no need like we're we're planning to have it just be a requirement that if you're doing this object store thing, you have exactly one normal class VDEV. Um, and right. you can have but other VDEVs of other classes. I could classes, see. But... I guess I, I guess S three doesn't really have the same concept, but wanting to have you know two VDEVs split across availability zones or something. Um, um, like a mirror, some, a mirror of those two. Is uh, that what you're saying? Possibly, yeah, or just something where all the VDEVs wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same. But I don't know that we need to worry about it too much. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's something that I hadn't really thought about until you started talking about it just now is uh, specifying VDEV properties as part of the the pool creation and how to do that in a way that doesn't end up, you know, tacking a bunch of stuff on the end of each VDEV as you're specifying it or whatever, each member of the VDEV as you're specifying it because that gets really ugly. Yeah. Really fast. yeah, yeah, we thought about that and we're kind of like, well, we can just get away with having these be pool properties because we're only going to let you have one object store VDEV in the pool. And so we know which one they apply to, uh, but it is a little, a little wacky. I don't imagine the, I want to, I guess, put it on the agenda for next time. Uh, zpool status as exposed as pool properties or something so that you can get it more yeah, automatically absolutely. and and some of it the problem right now is most of the the way it's constructed is all done in the the user space bits in libzfs and in in the zpool command line tool itself mm. uh and in the properties we you know we'd fill out the text on the kernel side instead uh so that's why I haven't done it already, but I'm very interested in being able to do things like get the current scrub or resolver progress by getting some properties uh, and yeah. being able to make better GUI displays of that and so on. Yeah, that would be great. 
I imagine that you'd be getting like kind of each component of that as an, a property whose type is a number, right? Like, you know, yeah, number like, of bytes scrubbed, number of bytes to scrub or whatever. And then like, you know, building something on top of that that shows a progress bar or whatever. Yeah, but then also having one for like the the action thing when it says what's wrong with the pool or whatever and a couple other ones like that. And some of those maybe apply to a VDEV, not the whole pool now and, and you can get really complicated, but yes, more properties is more better. <laughs> Which yeah. brought up the other thing we talked about at some point was do we need an extra property type like verbose or something that isn't displayed by default, but is there if you ask for it? Uh, if we're getting to, if, if we get to the point where we're having too many properties, do we need some like yeah. hidden by default properties, but not the hidden we properties do. we have now? Okay. Um, well, yeah, that's interesting. I think we're over time. So yes. I want to respect folks meeting time. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have another meeting in four weeks. It'll also be at this time, one o'clock Pacific on, uh, looks like May 25th. So thanks everyone and uh, we'll see you in four weeks.